Welcome to week three. This week, we're going to talk about cryptography, which is a favorite topic of mine. So we're going to cover terminology, different algorithms, a little bit of the history, and I'll give you links where you can find more detailed information on the history of crypto cryptography. And we're also going to look at incident response and a subset of incident response, basic forensics. Again, unless otherwise cited, all quoted material in this presentation are from the ISC squared common body of knowledge, the official guide to the CISSP by Stephen Hernandez. For a brief history of cryptography, see the link shown on the screen now. This is a chapter from a, uh, a book that I wrote for InfoSec Institute. Cryptography. What is it? It's an art and a science. It's the use of deception and mathematics to hide data, as in steganography, or to render data unintelligible through the transformation of data into an unreadable state, ciphertext, and to ensure that a message has not been altered in transit. A signature. Another feature of some cryptographic systems is the ability to provide assurance of who sent the message authentication of source, and proof of delivery. All of these things we will cover in this lecture. So let's go over some terms. First, digital signatures. Digital signatures are also sometimes called electronic signatures, and they enable non-repudiation with the use of hash algorithms. Non-repudiation is the state in which a sender cannot deny that they sent a specific message. Um, with a specific content. Asymmetric encryption or public key encryption, it uses two keys, a public and a private. We're going to go into this in more detail later in this lecture. Digital certificate, public keys are typically stored on a certificate that is shared with others, and the private key is shared with a certificate half or is kept and the certificate half that is kept only by the person or organization to whom the certificate was issued. A certificate authority issues certificates, revokes them as well. It's also a trusted entity, someone who is trusted by everyone who is using the certificate method of authentication, or verification of identity. Registration authorities then are agents, if you will, of the certificate authority that actually issue the digital certificates. They, they take care of the person or the organization registering and requesting a certificate. Plain text or clear text is unencrypted information. Whereas ciphertext or a cryptogram is the scrambled information that the plain text is turned into after it passes through an encryption algorithm. A crypto system is the entire cryptographic operation. It includes the algorithm, the key, and the key management system. The algorithm is the program that actually does the encryption. The key is fed to the algorithm so that the output can be decrypted later only by people with the key. The key management system is, is needed to protect the keys for all encryption and to provide the keys to the people who need them to access the information for performing business operations. Encryption is the process of converting plain text to ciphertext, and decryption is the process of going the other way, taking ciphertext and converting it using a key to its original plain text. A key or crypto variable is input that controls the operation of the cryptographic algorithm. Again, an algorithm, and this is an important point, is not secret. Any Anyone or any vendor who tells you that their cryptographic algorithm is secret and that adds to security is just blowing smoke. 
In the cryptography profession, algorithms are public. That way, everybody can test them. We do not rely on the algorithm for security. We don't rely on keeping the algorithm secret for security. However, the key must be kept secret. So it is the key that is fed to the cryptographic algorithm that actually results in a specific set of, of ciphertext. You change the key, you change the ciphertext. The same key that was used to encrypt the data must be used to decrypt the data. Non-repudiation is maintaining evidence so that the sender and the recipient of data cannot deny having participation in the communication. And this is an important piece of digital signatures and of, uh, of, of devices certifying their identity to each other. An algorithm is a mathematical function. It's a program that takes a key and plain text as input and outputs plain text or ciphertext, depending on whether you're decrypting or encrypting. Cryptanalysis is the study of defeating cryptographic techniques. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. When a new cryptographic algorithm is released, all cryptographers try to crack it. So these cryptanalysts go out and they try to find weaknesses in the algorithms. This is why we, we should always use a publicly released algorithm that has been shown to be strong by cryptanalysis. An organization that maintains a secret encryption algorithm has not exposed it to a wide variety of cryptanalysis, and this is a problem. Collision is when a hash function generates the same output for different inputs. A hash function takes text and creates a fixed length value that cannot be reversed. This is used for digital signatures, and for uh, ensuring that the information has not changed since the hash was created. A collision is when you have, is when two, when a hash function can generate the same output for different sets of input text. This is not a good thing. We want to minimize collisions or eliminate them altogether with hash functions that we use. Key space is the total number of possible key values in a cryptographic algorithm, or including a password. So you have a keys and passwords. So a 20-bit key, a bit is a 1 or a 0, has a key space of 2 to the 20th power, or 1,048,576 possible keys. That sounds like a big number, but it isn't. This would be a very weak key space. This is something that, could, that a modern computer could go through in no time at all. An eight-character password using only lowercase alpha characters has a key space of 2.83 times 10 to the 15th possible combinations. This is a very large number. Brute force attack against a password like this is possible, but it's probably not practical given that the first attack against a password database of dictionary attacks will probably come up with several passwords quickly. Now, hopefully in your organization, this is not the case, but in the case of a website where customers go in and log in, create weak passwords, that is definitely the case. A 10 character password, now, it's the 10 character password we're talking about it uses uppercase, one character set, lowercase letters, another character set, digits, another character set, and symbols, such as the at sign, exclamation point, etc. Another character set has a key space of 6.05 times 10 to the 19th possible combinations. Trying to crack a password here with a brute force attack is impractical. It isn't going to be pursued for very long by an attacker. Attackers today, most of them, are focused on getting in, getting the work done, getting getting a return on their investment, and getting out. What this might, what this doesn't include, this this quick attack that's quick in and out. What doesn't include are advanced persistent threats that might hang around for a long time, but. 
In those types of attacks, instead of trying to crack a password or key of this size, they're going to try to get to the data in other ways, uh, such as uh, getting the data as it passes through the user's computer with software that the user has inadvertently installed there. But key space is very important when we talk about um, the security of encryption. The larger the key space, the more secure the encrypted data. Work factor, the time and effort necessary to break a protection control. Initialization vector, we're gonna look at this a little bit later when we look at a graphic of, of block ciphers, but initialization vector is something that is inserted into the initial cycle of, the, of, a, um, of a symmetric block cipher that helps to increase its entropy. In other words, it makes it, it makes it a little harder to get from the encrypted, the, from the ciphertext back to the plain text. The, the differences between the ciphertext and the plain text are so much different as entropy increases that it, it gets increasingly difficult to try to get from the ciphertext back to the plain text. Transposition is one way of ciphering, reordering the plain text to hide the message as shown on the screen. Obviously, this is not secure, but this is, this is a term that you need to know. Substitution is replacing one letter in plain, one letter in plain text with another. So in other words, if you, you might re replace a B with a C or a B with a Z. Um, again, because there's very little entropy in a substitution cipher, it's, it's get, it can be very easy to get back to the plain text. One way that a cryptanalyst would, would start is to look for repetition, for how many times a specific character or substitution character occurs within the ciphertext. Certain letters occur with more frequency than others. E is the most common letter in the English language, for example. So the substitution character that occurs most often in the text is probably an E. And it goes back from there. And, you know, R, S, T, L, and E are very common letters, and those are letters that might be tried first. In any case, only using substitution to go one step from plain text to cipher text does not provide enough entropy to protect your plain text information. Confusion is mixing the key values used during repeated rounds of encryption. Diffusion, mixing up the location of plain text when building a cipher text. So move it around, take a block of plain text from here, move it up front, take another block, move it to the middle. That's diffusion. The avalanche effect is a minor change in either the key or the plain text results in a large change in the cipher text. This is a good thing. Now, I don't expect you to remember all these terms just from the lecture. However, it is important that you know these terms. So I would recommend that you set up some flashcards using 3x5 index cards and simply memorize these terms. Now we're going to look at cryptography modes. The first one we're going to look at are stream-based ciphers. A stream cipher is a symmetric key cipher. In other words, as the information is input into the algorithm, it is immediately encrypted instead of going through multiple cycles. And it's combined with a pseudo-random cipher digit stream or a key. In a stream cipher, each plain text digit is encrypted one at a time with the corresponding digit of the key stream. So you take the key and you use a, bit, a digit in the key to encrypt a character or a digit in the plain text. An alternative name is a state cipher. 
as the encryption of each digit is dependent on the current state. In other words, the state of the of the plain text digit and the uh, key digit. In practice, a digit is technically a bit and the combining operation an exclusive OR. XOR plain text with a key. The slide shown on the screen is a uh, is an excerpt from Wikipedia showing an XOR truth table. Note that in XOR, if the digits are the same, a zero comes out. If a if the digits are different, then a one comes out. And this is the way we XOR information in a going from plain text to cipher text using XOR. And this slide is also an excerpt from Wikipedia. We see how to, a key could be XOR with data. In this case, our key is 11110011, and it keeps repeating. While, and we, we apply each set of seven or eight bits to the key to come up with the ciphertext. So here is the key, and here is the first eight bits of the plain text. Here is the key again, and here is the second eight bits of the plain text. So this is XOR, this is an XOR operation that is associated with many different types of encryption, uh, but the one we're talking about right now is the stream cipher. Next one is a block cipher. Block ciphers are more common today because they provide more entropy. So a block cipher operates on blocks or chunks of text and as plain text is fed into the crypto system, it is divided into blocks of preset size. Most block ciphers use a combination of substitution and transposition to perform their operations. So here's a list of different block ciphers. And I'm not going to read this table to you. This is something that I, re that I recommend that you spend a little time with. But it shows what the, or how the specific, the algorithm uh, uses blocks and what the algorithm is used for. And here's an example of cipher block chaining. So notice we have the initialization vector, which we talked about earlier, which helps to increase entropy because with each iteration of, or, or for each block that is encrypted, we take the previous ciphertext and XOR it with the, with the new block of plaintext. Well, an initial block of plaintext, there is no previous ciphertext to XOR it with. So we use an initialization vector to do that. And so in this particular case, we take the first block of plaintext, we, use the, we XOR it with the initialization vector, and that gives us the block cipher encryption. Or it gives us the, it goes through the block cipher encryption algorithm and produces a block of ciphertext. We take that block of ciphertext and we XOR it with the next block of plain text, run it through and, and come up with the ciphertext. And we keep doing this. And, and it, then we run it through the blank software, cipher encryption using the key, and we come up with ciphertext. So this is how we use an initialization vector, an XOR, in a block cipher to help to increase the entropy. Now, this is a very simple, simple ex example of a block cipher. Some block ciphers are, are more complex than this, but this gives you a good idea of how they work. So what are the important elements in block ciphers? Again, it's the initialization vector. It's, it's a binary value and it's not a secret and it's used for initializing input for a block encryption sequence. So in a block cipher crypto system, keeping the initialization vector as well as the key secret is not a good idea 
for ensuring the, the strength of your encryption. Key length, we talked about this before. Key length directly impacts both the key space and by doing so impacts the work factor. It significantly increases the work factor as the key gets bigger. And long keys do not necessarily mean strong encryption. The reason being is that the, the algorithm could be weak. So remember we talked about the fact that cryptanalysts test every security algorithm that is made public. Using a security algorithm or an encryption algorithm that has been cracked is, is, is a bad thing. It doesn't matter how big your key is, if the algorithm, if people know how to get around the algorithm to get back to the plain text, the length of the key is meaningless. Also, if somebody's got a, a private algorithm that has not been tested and is full of holes, a long key also, in that case, is meaningless. And finally, if you have long keys and you're using them in an accepted, strong algorithm, but your key management system is weak, it's insecure, then theft of your keys the unauthorized access to your keys means that your encryption, your crypto system is not secure. A null cipher. A null cipher can be used where encryption is not necessary, but you want to sort of hide your information in a weak way. Examples are IPsec and SSL. They offer the choice to authenticate but not require encryption. So you can, you can authenticate the sender and receiver, but you're not really hiding the information. So anybody sitting with a, uh, with a sniffer would be able to pick up the packets and look at the, uh, the payloads. Data hiding is another null cipher. In this particular case I have here, I took I love pizza and simply hit it in the, as the first letter in each word in the sentence, I left out very expensive pieces in Zanzibar Zoo Arcade. This is another way. This is also a form of steganography, hiding data inside of, pic of images or of text. This is a sample of a substitution cipher. And again, this is from the, uh, the chapter in my book at the InfoSec Institute on cryptography. A substitution cipher simply assigns a, another digit to each letter of the alphabet. In this particular case, A is assigned 7, B is assigned 8, C 9, etc. So if I take the plain text message, the tanks will arrive at 1300, going back to my military days, I simply take the T and replace it with Q. I take the H and replace it with E. And I do the same thing for the rest of the message, and I come up with the cipher text highlighted in yellow. This is a substitution cipher. It's one of the earliest ways of ciphering. It's known as a monoalphabetic substitution shift cipher. That's its official name. And we're going to look at a polyalphabetic substitution cipher in a couple minutes. This is not a strong cipher. Because if you look at the, let's look at the E, for example. E is always B. There is no entropy here. R is always O. And remember, R, S, T, L, and E are common letters. And R is also a, a letter that commonly occurs in pairs. This is not that difficult to come up with a few of the letters. T, also a common letter. The substitution character does not change. So as you can see, the entropy here is very low, and this would be easy to crack for a good cryptanalyst. Now let's look at the polyalphabetic cipher. This particular approach was developed by Plays de Venier. It uses a keyword, and we're going to look at an example from my book. The polyalphabetic cipher uses a 
table and a key. So you can see that here our key is fringe and it's repeated over and over again over the plain text, which is get each soldier a meal. So to use this table, we go down the column to the first letter of the, of the key here, F and G, and we go over to G up here in, this in, the, in the top row. So we go F over to G and we get an M. That's the first character of our cipher text. Likewise, we go R and then out to E. And remember, it's E on the top line, which gives the character W, which is the next character in our cipher text. And we keep doing this until the cipher text is, and we keep doing this until the cipher text is complete. Now, there are no repetitions. So E, in this case, will almost always be a different letter. It's very difficult to tell whether uh, a letter is an E, an R, a T, because of repetition. However, the, the space between, or the distance, between the plain text and the cipher text is still one step. It's still a little, it's still too close. There's not enough entropy. Therefore, a cryptanalyst can cr crack this particular cipher. This is not a cipher that we should use in our organizations. It is a good example, however, of how cryptography progressed as weaker crypto systems were cracked. Now, the one-time pad is probably the strongest encryption method we have. However, it, it requires that both the sender and receiver have the same keypad. It's actually a pad of paper that, or electronic or actual paper that has sheets in it. Each sheet might look like this. So it has a serial number, and the serial number is the uh, sheet that was used to encrypt and it's the same sheet that the receiver must use to decrypt. Once the sheet is used, it is never used again. And the characters on, this, on each sheet are randomly generated. So let's see how this works. Now we can do a simple, simple substitution. We could sub simply substitute the first character in the our message security is important and substitute it with a z which is the first letter in the key but in many cases if not most cases the number the letters are assigned numbers and those numbers are used in modulo arithmetic now what that means is that we have 26 characters so that if we add the value of two characters together and it's greater than our 26, the number of characters we have, then we subtract the 26 to get our value. So that's called modulo or mod arithmetic. So let's step through a couple of these. So the first letter in our plain text is S. The value of S is 18. We add that to the value of Z, which is 25, and we get 43. 43 is greater than 26, so we subtract 26 to get 17. The value of 17 or 17 is R. So we put R here as the first letter of our cipher text. Next letter. Next letter in our plain text is E. We add that to the second letter of the pad, which is D. We get 7. 7 is less than 26, so we simply drop it down. We use 7, and 7 is H. So as you can see, we keep going through this until we end up with our ciphertext. Now, to decrypt, you subtract 26, or you subtract the key from the plane, from the ciphertext. So in this case, 
instead of adding the key, we're going to subtract the key. So the keypad, first letter, is Z. We subtract it from the cipher, first character of the ciphertext, and we get minus 8. It's a negative number, so we add 26. Before, remember, up here we subtracted. When we decrypt, we add 26 to negative numbers, coming up with 18, and we would come out with a character of S. Now we keep doing that across the across all the characters until we get our plain text. Again, this is our key, ZDX, WWW, -E -A -W 0 that we're using. If our message was longer, we, we would just keep going through these characters until we got to the end. Um, and a lot of the pads are bigger than this. This is just an excerpt from a pad. So here's our ZDXWWEJKAWD, etc. Now, we can also add numbers and special characters. When we do that, it changes the number of characters that we have. So this number 26 could change to 36 if we add numbers. We can also shift so that A is actually 3 and Z is 2. We shift everything over uh, to the right so that, again, A is 3, and then the letters on the end, or the numbers on the end, rotate over. It still works. That would just add a little more entropy to the process. This is considered one-time pads, are con and just like one-time passwords today, are considered to be the most secure method of encryption. The only way, just about the only way, that a cryptanalyst could crack this code is to have access to the one-time pad. The entropy is extreme, assuming that your pad generation is always random. Now let's look at common encryption keys and algorithms. The first one that we're going to look at are symmetric block ciphers. And we're going to look at those that are broken and those that are in common use. The first one is DES. Data encryption standard. This was the encryption that everybody used for several years. However, it is not secure. It uses a 56-bit key, and it has been cracked. Triple DES increases key length to 168 bits, but it's still not strong enough for some encryption challenges. In other words, if you use it and you get breached, it's not really considered due diligence to... Uh, Encrypt your most sensitive data with triple DES. AES, however, is the standard cipher today, the standard encryption standard today. It's based on the Rinsdale cipher, and it come, uses 128, 192, and 256-bit keys. Um, this has been theoretically cracked, but the power of computers today is not strong enough to make it the cracking of this encryption standard practical. And I want to say something at this point. Um, cracking encryption, cracking a accepted encryption standard that is, that is currently used and currently promoted by think, people like NIST and the NSA is impractical. So, one of the probably the only there are two ways to get data that are encrypted with AES. One is to get the key. Uh, it can be a password. So let's say, for example, that a laptop is encrypted and a user accesses it with a password. If they use one of their kids' names and they have three children, they use one of their names as the password that will more than likely end up with bypassing AES if an attacker gets their hands on the laptop. Another way to do it is to grab the information when as it's unencrypted or while it's un while it's unencrypted. This is done by putting data on or putting a malware on the user's machines and grabbing data there. So the point I want to make here is that encryption is only one level in a controls framework. Encryption by itself 
is not the, the panacea for all things security. It is just another control. If you don't have other controls around encryption, then the encryption will fail as a security control. Two fish and blowfish are also two accepted encryption methods. They're not considered standards, but they're safe enough, as well as IDEA and RC5. RC5 is patented by RSA. IDEA was patented, but the patent has expired. So the only patented, in other words, something that might require a fee to RSA, is RC5. The rest are free for use. Asymmetric cryptography is different than symmetric cryptography in that it uses two keys. So going back to symmetric cryptography for a minute, symmetric cryptography is very fast. Even though it, 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 can, it go, can go through multiple iterations, i.e. AES goes through multiple iterations for the blocks of data that are fed into it, which, which is one of the reasons it makes it very secure. But computers today are strong, are fast enough where those multiple iterations add almost no processing time to the user's experience. Asymmetric cryptography, on the other hand, is slow. So we don't use it to encrypt large blocks of data. What we use it for is to exchange small pieces of data like keys. So asymmetric cryptography is known as, also known as public key cryptography and usually implemented as PKI. The first iteration was, was created by Diffie, Hellman, and Merkel in 1976 and is known as Diffie, Hellman. Rives, Chamonier, and Eidelman developed RSA in 1978 and it supports both key exchange and electronic signatures, whereas a Diffie, Hellman is just a key exchange algorithm. The um, one that is emerging today and that is stronger than either Diffie-Hellman or the RSA algorithms is ellipt elliptic curve cryptography. It uses a smaller key, requires less storage and transmission requirements, and a 256-bit ECC public key provides the same security as a 3072-bit RSA key. So the processing is faster, the storage is, is less, and overall the algorithm provides a much more secure ciphertext. So let's take a look at how a public key and private key set work. First of all, it's important to understand that the public key and private key are mathematically related in such a way that if you encrypt with one, you must decrypt with the other. So, for example, if I encrypt with a person's public key, that person must use their private key to decrypt it. This helps us to assure that the person to whom we want to send it is the only person who can open the message that we're encrypting. The public key is distributed to the public either via a, a public key database, as in a PKI uh, system, or is provided by the person to whom the, the certificates with the keys was, uh, to whom it was issued. So the plain text is encrypted using the, in this case, the receiver's public key. The receiver receives the decrypted information, decrypts it with the private key, with his or her private key, re re and resulting in the plain text. In the next or bottom example, we have the person who owns the keys using her private key to send encrypted information, which could be a digital signature, to, the, to a receiver. Now, remember that the person with the private key should be the only person in the world with that private key. That helps the receiver to authenticate the receiver. So the plain text is encrypted with the private key. It is sent over to the receiver, and the receiver uses the public key of the sender to decrypt the information. This is an example of a handshake for TLS or for SSL. 
And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do as you look at this graphic is I'm going to step through the steps provided in Wikipedia for a TLS handshake, which is very similar and we should track well with this graphic. So first the handshake begins with a when a client connects to a TLS enabled server requesting a secure connection and presents a list of supported cipher suites. That would be ciphers and hash functions. From this list the server picks a cipher, usually the most secure one that the that the client in this case is labeled as host. Uh, picks the most secure cipher and hash functions supported by the client and notifies the client of the of its decision. It also sends back its identification, the server sends back its identification in the form of a digital certificate. The certificate usually contains the server name, the trusted certificate authority or CA, and the server's public encryption key. The client may contact the server that issued the certificate, in other words the CA, and confirm the validity of the certificate before proceeding. In order to generate the session keys used for the secure connection, the client encrypts a random number with the server's public key and sends the result to the server. Only the server should be able to decrypt it with its private key. Remember, only in this case, since the client encrypted the key or the number, with the server's public key, only the server's private key can decrypt the, the, the encrypted information. And then from the random number, both parties generate key material for encryption and decryption. This key material is a shared secret or a session key that both sides know about. And now that is used for symmetric encryption to encrypt data as it passes through the secured link, SSL or TLS link. And remember, we use symmetric encryption because it's faster. We, if we used asymmetric encryption for encrypting all information that went across a secured link, it would slow things down considerably. So now let's look at message integrity and signatures. Message integrity controls ensure the content has not been modified. We do this with hashing, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. This helps to enforce non-repudiation. Remember, that is ensuring that only the user receives the message and that the sender cannot deny sending the message with the content that the user, that the, that the receiver actually received. Symmetric algorithms can be used for message integrity. However, they are not really designed for document signing and message authentication. What they are for is to mask the content. So they're good for confidentiality. They can support um, authentication if, it's, if we know that both sides have the same shared key. So asymmetric algorithms, however, are normally used for message integrity controls. They include RSA, Algamal, and Elliptic Curve. They can use, they're used for signing as well as message authentication. So how does that work? So signing and message authentication are pretty much part of the same process. So we take the data, the sender takes the data and sends it through a hash function. A hash function like SHA-1 creates a value that is always the same length. Regardless of how long the data is, the hash value will always be the same length. The smallest change, however, to the data will make a large change in the hash value. Then the sender uses the uh, his private key to encrypt the hash. This not only protects the integrity of the information by by hiding the hash so the hash can't be changed if the data is changed and it acts as a signature that is added to the data and sent to the, the receiver the receiver receives the information and does two things. One, they run the plain text from the message through the same hash function as the sender and, and derive a hash value. They also use the sender's or the signer's public key 
to decrypt the hash value that the sender calculated and compare the sender's hash value to the hash value calculated by the receiver. If they're the same, that means that the data was not modified in transit. If they're different, the data was modified and the information should not be considered as authentic. So let's get out of cryptography and go to forensics and incident response. So forensics consists of four different phases. It's the identification and gathering of evidence, the preservation of that evidence, maintaining a chain of custody for all gathered evidence, and the presentation of findings. In the identification and gathering of evidence, the first thing we do is examine the surroundings when we arrive at the crime scene. Everything in the scene, the focus of our investigation, is considered evidence unless otherwise determined. So we stand in the doorway of, let's say, a cubicle, and we take it in. We look at everything as it sits at the time we arrive. The recommended approach at this point is to take photographs, photographs of the desktop, photograph of anything hanging on walls, photographs of the floor. Live system forensics is trying to retrieve information from the system before it is shut down. This isn't always possible, but when possible, it is a very important piece of gathering evidence. A physical examination of the system. What's plugged into it? What ports are in use? If the ports are in use, what do they lead to? Could the devices on the other end of cables connected to the device be used to store information relevant to the investigation? And of course, examination of storage. Retrieving a hard drive and, for example, and making a forensics copy and using that copy to determine whether or not the drive contains evidence pertaining to the situation under investigation. In the preservation of evidence, the first thing we want to look at is record keeping. Record keeping is very important. Everything we do from the time we arrive at the scene to going back to our office for forensics uh, searches and investigations, every single thing we do should be kept in a log in detail with dates, times, and a detailed description of what, we've, what we did and what we found. It also includes the use of reliable tools. Any tools we use to retrieve evidence from systems should be tools that are acceptable to the industry forensics profession and that are tools with which we are familiar and can prove that we know how to use. Evidence safekeeping, making sure that evidence is safe from destruction or loss. And this goes along with working in isolation. People should not just be walking in and out uncontrolled into a crime scene or into a work area where you're doing forensics work and chain of custody, maintaining a record of who had access to the uh, evidence and when. And we're gonna take a look at this, how we do this in a couple more slides. So the following slide, which is the first page of a forensics report, is from the free book, Forensic Examination of Digital Evidence, a Guide for Law Enforcement, which is available at the link shown. So this page um, at the top, just general information about the investigation, but what, what's really important and why I really put this page up is to show you the detail of the notes that the investigator took. Now these notes, in this particular case, are from, uh, from the point that the evidence was retrieved from the evidence room, potentially. It was not something that the investigator retrieved himself from a crime scene. 
However, if he had been uh, shown up at the crime scene, the first entries here would be detailed information about his arrival, what he saw, and what he did at the crime scene. Everything, again, must be logged and included in the report. This is an evidence tag. An evidence tag is usually used for evidence that can't fit into an evidence bag or when you're using evidence bags that don't have evidence information, uh, a form right on the bag, which we're gonna see in a couple slides. So it's important that evidence be tagged appropriately so that we can properly identify it in court. This is a Faraday bag. A Faraday bag is used for mobile devices so that they cannot communicate with the outside world. Anytime that we allow a device to communicate with the outside world, we cannot then verify that the data did not change after we seized it. And this is an important point. We want to be able to show that the data or the information on, the system, on this device for example, the one shown here, the smartphone, is exactly as it was when we seized it from the subject of the investigation. This is an evidence bag that includes two things. It includes evidence tag information and it includes a chain of custody. Now, chains of custody are very important. From the time a piece of evidence is collected to the time that it is released back to its owner, every single person who had access to it needs to sign the chain of custody. So it's who it came from, who it went to, and the date. Now, there are chain of custody forms that are more detailed than this, but this is usually sufficient. If there's a link missing in the chain, if somebody took the evidence and did not sign the chain of custody form, and the defense can show that that happened, then the evidence is likely to be considered tainted and may be thrown out. So forensics is part of security incident response. Incident response is a very, very important control in a security controls framework. If there is no documented practice incident response process in an organization, then its security framework is incomplete. The purpose of incident response is to recover from in incidents quickly, preserve forensic evidence where possible, and follows a predefined and practiced process that includes detection using logs, log alerts like security information event management where we aggregate logs into a, play into a central location, run them through a correlation engine looking for anomalous behavior across the network or devices, user reporting of anomalous behavior, and anything else that we have in place that would alert us to something going on that isn't quite right. The next thing in your plan is response. How do we analyze what's going on? We can't respond or contain, we can't contain or eradicate something if we don't know exactly what's going on, the nature of the incident. So the first part of response is to analyze what's going on and then contain the event so that we mitigate business impact. And remember too that one of the most important things we're doing here is maintaining human safety. Reporting. We need to keep all stakeholders informed report to law enforcement, and manage the media. Now this isn't something that the security team or the incident response team normally does. An incident response team consists of more than just security personnel. Uh, it consists of security personnel, network engineers, server engineers, potentially somebody from an internal legal department, and representatives of the business. The role of the incident response team is to analyze, contain, and work to the analyze and contain the threat and eradicate the threat and restore the business processes. The reporting piece of this is for the incident response team to report to management what, it's, what it finds at each stage of the response process so that management then can, re, 
can inform customers and shareholders and law enforcement and the media as it sees fit. Recovery is the eradication and restora- eradication of the threat and restoration of business processes. And finally, the final step is after everything else is done, the team sits down, all stakeholders involved with the incident stay, sit down and take a look at not only the incident that occurred and what caused it, but also the effectiveness of the response. We always have room to improve. So this is a good point to sit down, sit back and take a look and see where we're where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. In any case, root cause analysis is our primary tool. The following slide on root cause analysis is from a a two-article series I wrote for Tech Republic. And here I used the five whys from the 8D problem-solving methodology to get to root cause. You notice we have the incident, and from the incident we work backwards trying to find the the initial event that started the chain of cause and effect that led to the incident. So if we ask why, we came up with two different things here. And really, we're asking why was there a business impact to begin with. And we see that there's a proximate cause of bad system configuration, but we also show that there's a chaotic response to the incident. This is actually from an event that I managed post-incident, where we sat down and I managed the root cause analysis meeting. So the chaotic response to incident was on the part of customer support instead of stepping through a step-by-step process to deal with the event, they started throwing solutions at it, which caused the, the outage to last longer than it should have. And going through that, finding the root cause on that one, which is not shown here, we were able to ensure that in the future, a step-by-step process was followed so that the a process, any process like this, could be restored to normal quickly. On the other, on the right side, bad system configuration, and I'm not going to read these each one to you. You can see them for yourselves. We by asking why each time we hit a a an event with a potential set of conditions, and that's an important point. Events happen within the context of a set of conditions. It's important to, to, when asking, when answering why, to include what happened and the conditions in which it occurred. And you can see we work back to, finally, the business user complained that PC running a critical system was slow and had too many intermittent problems. So what this did, it led customer to support, decide, okay, we're going to throw in one of our one of our regular images to see if we can fix this problem. So really, questions four and five show an issue where the customer support did not consider the fact that any PC that supports a vendor device and it was initially configured by the vendor might need to be replaced by the vendor or the whole process fails. So this was what this was the finding and so in the future any type of system that was supporting a vendor device was was replaced by the vendor or at least the vendor was closely involved in the PC's replacement which prevented this kind of problem from happening happening again. The reason we do root cause analysis is because we don't want to treat symptoms we want to get again to that to that event, that initial event that ca- started the chain of cause and effect leading to the incident. And the farther away from the incident or farther away from the business process that we can get to identify the root cause, the easier it is to put controls in place to eliminate either the root cause or to monitor for effects that may occur when that root cause is present. 
We may not always be able to eliminate the root cause, but we certainly should be able to monitor for the effects of the root cause to break the chain of cause and effect. Okay, and that's the end of the lecture for this week. If you have any questions, please ask. And remember, this, the lecture is not a replacement for the material. It is a supplement.